Yeah, so first, thank, thank you very much for everyone for coming. I wasn't sure how many people would be here tonight, but just a few archaeologists, given, given that it's a drill independence day. So it's great to have a crowd, and I know some people are watching online. My name is Paul Bowman. I'm from Calgary. I'm not a historian. I'm not an archaeologist. I'm a geophysicist and a, and a groundwater scientist. But I've had the privilege over a number of years, first in 2008, and then from 2016 to 2022, to work with archaeologists, historians, and museum curators at Holocaust museums in Latvia, Lithuania, and, and Poland to work on a number of archaeological sites, Holocaust atrocity sites, where myself and my colleagues were essentially the eyes and ears of, of the archaeologists and historians using various geophysical techniques, different types of electronic sensors that measure different physical properties see what's in the subsurface, sometimes to guide archaeologists in their excavations, or sometimes in some of these archaeological sites to avo actually avoid excavation. So we're going to begin this talk 13 months ago when someone I, I certainly consider to be an absolute bona fide hero of our time, Vladimir Zelensky, the Jewish comedian and president of, of the country of of Ukraine, gave one of his tailor-made talks to the Israeli parliament. Of course, he gave these to a number of um, countries that were allies with Ukraine, supportive of, of Ukraine, and he tailored them to the specific population. But I think he got it wrong when he, when he gave his talk to Israel. And the talk was given, um, it was given to the Knesset, directly to the Knesset, but it was also broadcasted in public in the, in the main square in Tel Aviv. And from the official Translation, he said, Ukrainians have made their choice 80 years ago, they, they rescued Jews. And, uh, and generally, he gave this message in his talk that Israeli and the country of Israel, the political state of Israel, should treat Ukrainians as Ukrainians treated Jews during World War II. And as one Israeli parliamentarian somewhat sarcastically said, we are a moral nation, we could not possibly do that. And history supports the parliamentarian's point of view. There were one and a half million Jews killed in Ukraine during, during the war. Um, Ukrainians were complicit at all levels of the society, from in, the murder, in mass murder, from village level up to organized militia, as is documented in photographs, testimonies. And in fact, in the Operation Reinhardt camps, where, where much of the killing proceeded, Treblinka, Belzec, and, and uh, Sobibor, Ukrainians served as the, as the main guard force. So, what was Zelensky thinking? And of course, I, I don't know. Perhaps the Israeli parliament was in his audience, perhaps it was the wider diaspora Jewish community, perhaps it was his fellow Ukrainians. But what I think he was saying was he was saying what he actually believed. Zelensky grew up in the Soviet education system. And for the Soviet Union, there simply was no Holocaust of Jews. There was no genocide of Jews. Almost no memorialization occurred at any of these mass killing sites in Eastern Europe in what was known as the Holocaust of Bolotron until the late 70s. And even in Babi Yar, in, down, in Kiev, on the outskirts of Kiev, where, where Zelensky himself lost many family members, there was no memorialization until the very, very late 70s. And we're going to begin at one of these mass killing sites from the Holocaust of, of Bullets in Kaunas in, in Lithuania. It's a very significant site because this is essentially where the Holocaust began in Lithuania. And why here? Well, when the, when the Germans um, reneged on their non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, they immediately crossed from Germany, which at that time, the board, board, at that point, the war was extended at the end of Poland into the Soviet Union, the Soviet Republic, which was crossing into Lithuania. So that occurred on June 22nd, 19, 1941. By June 24th, they had already taken Vilnius and, and what was the interwar capital of Lithuania, um, Kaunas. But even before, the, even before the Germans reached Kaunas, there was already mass killing happening among the population. So at this point in time, June 1941, the idea of, of a, a final solu solution of mass killing of the Jews in Europe was a very vague notion for, for the Nazis at that point. But upon entering Lithuania, especially on coming to Kaunas, they found both a complicit population and an infrastructure that was quite suitable to, to mass killing. So this is Fort Nine, this is the guardhouse of Fort Nine, which we're going to 
going to refer back to in a minute. And what you see here, we're looking down on a large scale with with, fort, with, with the actual fort in the background. Originally, when the, when the Germans came to count us, three days after entering, entering Lithuania, the Soviets retreated without a, without a fight. Again, they found a complicit population that had already begun violent killing of the, of the Jewish population. And so it was very easy for the, for the Germans to sort of um, to capture this and, and organize it. And they found these ring of forts, nine forts surrounding the city of, of Kaunas. So dungeons, moats, ready, ready for um, the type of killing that was then foreseen. So they first started the experiment, but they didn't know how they were going to do it. So they first started bringing Jews by the hundreds to Fort 4, then to Fort 5, and then to Fort, the, they brought 3,000 to Fort 7, and, and, and shot. But these forts, they were either too far or too close or up two steep hills. And eventually they settled on Fort 9, which was close to the Jewish area of Kaunas, Slobodka. So logistically, it fit what they wanted to do. And already, in, by the end of June, they already had Soviet POWs dig 14 trenches in this area in the foreground that the Germans euphemist, euphemistically called the battlefield. They executed those Soviet POWs, and then they began bringing Jews from the, from the ghetto that they were closing off in, in Slobodka in, in what's by the Yiddish word for count as Kovno, the, the Kovno ghetto, which at its peak in end of September held about 40,000 Jews. They started bringing Jews by 500, groups of 500, up to the battlefield, up to these trenches, and shooting them, and burying them. So, following the war, in typical Soviet fashion, the, what, the events that actually happened here were largely ignored, largely forgotten. Again, there was no real holocaust of, of Jews. And eventually, in the late 80s, Soviet Union did erect this colossal um, monument and it's called and it's called the monument to um, the, mo the, vic the monument to the victims of, of fascism, and that's generally how all of these monuments, all these memorial markers across Eastern Europe, read that here the victims of fascism are Soviet comrades, fell to the Hitlerites as they're called, and and the, and the Nazis. Of course, sites like this, and there's hundreds of sites like this. There's over 200 documented sites in Lithuania alone, and similar numbers in the other Baltic countries. Sites like this became iconic targets for Holocaust deniers because where are the burials, where are the trenches, where are the indications of, of mass murder? So in fact, there is, there is proof of what, there certainly is, other, is existing proof of what happened there. Soviets took um, Countess in early, 19, early August 1941 and they immediately did some exhumations. And then from and then from 1959 to 1971, they actually had organized archaeological investigations. They were largely done for war crimes purposes, but nevertheless, real archaeologists, and there in fact were female archaeologists. Um, the journals were created as part of one of our projects. We had all the journals uh, translated from, from Lithuanian to, to English. And you can see some of the things that were found in these trenches. First, reading the journals, of course, they found human bones, they found human ash. But thousands of um, steel shell casings, um, clothing, watches, knives, steel buttons, um, and documents, ID cards, passports. Because many of these people came up to the fort, were transported to the fort. Later, after the original um, ghetto de deportation, they were brought to the fort thinking that they were coming to, to work people, to um, work folks, work camps. And then the archaeologists, they also created a conceptual map of where they, these trenches lie. In. These 14 trenches, and it is a conceptual, conceptual map. There's no, there's no north arrow. There's no scaling. There's not even any contextual orientation of where the, where the trenches are. And we also have eyewitnesses. In February 1943, Germans were defeated at Stalingrad. They were in retreat. They knew the Nazis knew they were going to lose the war. The Russians, the Soviet Union, were approaching the Baltic. So the SS issued what became known as Action 1005, which mandated that all the, all the extermination camps in the Baltics and elsewhere in Eastern Europe, that they were to recruit enslaved Jewish populations that were going to then exhume the bodies and, and burn them. Burn the bodies, crush the bones, scatter or bury the, the, the ashes and hide the evidence. 
And this, this had happened, of course, at all the extermination camps, including Fort Nine. And in Fort Nine, there was a, what the German euphemistically called a burning brigade of 64 Jews, 63 men, and one woman. One woman. They were all recruited in September of 43. And on Christmas Eve, very late Christmas night, they escaped, every single one of them, in a pre-planned, meticulously well-executed escape. They first removed the bar, and that, that top bar that had been pre-sewn in the, in the cell in the dungeon. In the machine shop in the camp, they had already made copies of the keys of the other cells. They released all the other, all the other inmates. They had saws that they'd stolen from the, from the um, machine shop, and they cut the chains around their ankles. There was a, a, steel, a steel wall, a steel um, tunnel door that led to a tunnel that led to outside the prison, and, and they had they'd pre-drilled over weeks. They drilled over 100 holes that allowed them to just smash off a man-sized hole into the tunnel door. And then they, 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 ex they exited the, the tunnel here. They went right underneath the um, guard tower that you saw previously. It was a snowy Christmas Eve, and they covered themselves in a white sheet. And then they either went below the rampart or over the rampart, and then they erected wooden ladder that they pre-made in the, in the machine shop, and then dropped a rope ladder that they also pre-made, and all 64 came out to the battlefield and exited to the woods. 34 of those, um, 34 of those escapees were, they were all Jewish, but 34 came to a Russian POWs and they fled to the woods. The others were from Kovno and they fled back into the, into the ghetto. All the ones that, all the Soviet POWs that fled to the woods were caught and killed. 11 of those that, that fled to the, fled into the ghetto actually survived until the end of, end of the war. And they all, they all provide testimonies of what happened at, at Fort Nine. But nevertheless, in 2017, when we did our, our work there, there was no memorialization, there was no marking of the, these trenches. You would go, you would go to the battlefield where these atrocities happened. As you go to places like Babi Yar in Ukraine and many of these other sites, and you would see people posing for wedding photographs, pushing baby strollers, having picnics, walking their dog, playing picnics. And it's not because of anti-Semitism, it's not out of disrespect, it's simply because people did not know. So in 2017, archaeologists from the, from the, from the um, Israel Archaeological Survey from the Fort Nine Museum in the United States requested that we help them demarcate the, those trenches. So in 2017, we were actually pretty fortunate. We first created this drone image, this drone mosaic just to create a map, and it was, it was a, a year of record drought in Central Europe. And the general outline of the trenches, the shadow of the general outline of 12 of the trenches comes through pretty clearly, just from the dif differential um, stress on, on the well-drained trenches to the, to the grass surrounding the trenches. And then you saw the, you saw the type of artifacts that were found in the bottom of these trenches, steel knives, steel buttons, steel shell casings, and they did use steel shell casings and so forth. So we then used magnetic to um, map in detail the, the trench out, outlines. This is a high resolution magnetometer that specifically detects for iron and steel. And then we use this technique of electrical we use to be tomography to slice up the trenches to get better, better imagery, more detailed imagery of the exact depth of the trench, the exact widths of the, widths of the trench. And together with other pieces of geophysical instrumentation, other types of cameras that we flew from drones, we created, a, um, we created our best map of that constant map of all the different data sets of 12 of the trenches. We believe two of the trenches were destroyed in the construction of the colossal um, Soviet monuments to the victims of fascism and, and post-war construction. And, and you can see how it correlates reasonably well with the conceptual understanding of the, of the trenches. So while all this killing was going on in counties, again, with the interim capital of Lithuania between the wars, Similar and even greater atrocities were occurring in Vilnius, which was part of Poland during the interwar period, and then, and then um, brought back together with, with Lithuania in 1941 by the, by the Germans. So again, the Germans entered Lithuania on June 22nd, they also took Vilnius by June, June 24th. So looking down here, what I would say is, is, the, is the nicest part of, of Vilnius, and certainly one of the nicest places in, in all of Eastern Europe, the beautiful city of Vilnius, looking down on the old city, and this was the Jewish ghetto. 
and the Germans took Vilnius. Vilnius, more so than even New York, um, Vilnius is very much a Jewish city. It had a population of about 200,000, 80,000, 80 to 85,000 were Jewish. Yiddish was, Yiddish was spoken commonly on the street. Um, the other 40, 45% of the population was, was Polish. In fact, Lithuanians were just 5% of the population. Lithuanian was not a common language at the time. This, what we're looking down here is the ghetto, and the actual main gate of the ghetto was, was right here next to, the, next to the church. The German the SS immediately started establishing the ghetto and was completely enclosed in September of, of 1943. Having 85,000 Jews, there were a lot of study halls and synagogues. There were 145 synagogues. Only one synagogue survived, the Coral Synagogue. And the only reason, beautiful synagogue, but the only reason it survived is the SS used it as a stable for, um, for animals and as a storage house for munitions. So again, we got the SS and their advanced killing squads, the Einsatzgruppen. They found in Lithuania a population willing to collaborate. They found a large concentration of Jews, and they found infrastructure ready for killing. And what was that infrastructure? About 10 kilometers west of, west of Vilnius, the Soviet Union constructed 12 pits, 12 circular pits. And these were stone-lined pits that were designed to be foundations for fuel tanks for Soviet, um, for a Soviet aviation fuel for, for a military airfield that they had constructed nearby. And we're looking here, we're looking at a 1944 Soviet photograph of Pit 6. And we'll be coming back to Pit 6 in a, in a moment. So here's Vilnius. And not only do we have this bucolic forest with this ready-made um, killing area all, all set up, we've had the infrastructure of railroads, roads, and, and it was only 10 kilometers. You could even march people right to, right to, um, right to this, the, the site in the Ponar, in the Ponar forest that's referred to in in year eight. So, from 1941 to 1944, 100,000 people were executed by shooting in, in these pits. 70,000 of them were Jews, the other 30,000 were, were um, communists, Bolsheviks, um, um, resistance, resistance fighters, Roma, homosexuals, the usual um, target people for, for the Nazis. And we know more or less what happened. We have lots of, lots of pieces of evidence. First, we have photographs. Photographs from the Wehrmacht. Wehrmacht soldiers would come by on their way to Vilnius, or leaving Vilnius, and they would come up to the killing pits, and just like they were marching by the Eiffel Tower, they would come up and, and take photographs. So they'd come out on weekends to photograph the, photograph the killings. And we, know, and we know how it progressed. First, they started herding Jews through, through large trenches that funneled into these killing pits. And then they tried to simplify it by just put, pushing them right into the pits and killing them in the pits. And then they, in the end, they just drove people right up to the end and shot them at the, at the edge of the pits. Now we have a unique document from the Holocaust, the Pornary Diary. Kazimierz Sakovich, he was a journalist, Polish journalist, living in Vilnius. Soviets took, um, took Vilnius in 1939. They went crazy about free press, so there wasn't much work for journalists. So Sakovich, he, he moved out of the city, he didn't have any work, he took a small cottage in the Ponar Forest, lived simply at a garden, lived cheaply. And then early July 1941, he started to hear shooting, commotion, he climbed up to his second floor window, and then in an objective, um, completely de emotionally detached manner, he recorded what he saw, who was being killed, who was doing the killing, who was taking the booty, what were they doing it, uh, doing with it, um, the sounds, the smells, the sights, everything he saw. And he, wrote, and he, and he continued to do this right, right through into 1944. And he knew this, these documents would, would not be um, held in esteem by, certainly not by the Nazis and probably not by Soviets. So as he wrote this diary, he hid the pages in lemonade bottles, which he buried in his garden. In fact, Sakowicz was killed. He was shot in 1944. The, the exact circumstances are a little vague, but his, his documents were uncovered. They were unearthed in the, from the garden. They were put together into a diary, and they were actually translated into English in, in, um, in 1991. And then we have survivors from the early chilling period in the, in the pits. 
and not not many, really just a handful, but here's, here's one of them. Um, this is William Good. He was actually age 16, not age nine, and, and he, test, he gives a, a very dramatic testimony in the Israeli movie, Out of the Forest, um, in, in 2004. I've heard his testimony, um, I've heard it recorded, I've heard it told to me by his son, and he was in the ghetto, and they took him out, they, they loaded up a truck with other young men, they told him he was going to a work site, and the truck backs up, the canvas slips, and he describes how he just simply could not believe what he was seeing. It, didn't, it just did not fit with his, what he understood the universe to be like, that people he knew that were innocent of everything were being just lined up and shot and falling into the pit. He was, he was absolutely trembling and, and in complete shock and almost unable to move. So he was dragged to the end of the pit and what, and what they did, they generally shot people 10 by 10, sometimes at the end of the day, and they're mostly shot by, not by Nazis, but by Lithuanians. Sometimes at the end of the day, when they were too drunk to handle their weapons, they would just put people in the pit and throw a grenade in the pit. But anyways, uh, Good describes how he's at the edge of the pit, and then the nanosecond that the gunshots fired, his, his, knees, came, his knees give out, and he falls into the pit. And the bodies fall on top of him. I can never forget the body trauma, the convulsion of the dying man until he died. It was a short-lived thing, but he was on top of me and in the agony of death. So he stayed in the pit till the evening, he crawled out, he went back to the ghetto, and nobody believed him. And if they did believe him, they still couldn't comprehend. And William Good, of course, survived till the, till the, end, of the, till the end of the war. So in, 2000, so in 2016, the very, very small museum in Pona and the, and the um, Jewish Museum, an archaeologist, American archaeologist, and an archaeologist from the Israel Antiquities, Antiquities Authority, they asked us to locate the first of the 12 pits. So the estimated 12 pits, six have been memorialized, but the largest pit, five have been, have been memorialized, but the largest pits, and the first pit where the killing began, was called Soviet Pit 1, the exact location was not known. So here's a diagram of the of the site, not a diagram, a digital elevation of the, of the memorial as it existed in 2000, 2016 when myself and my colleague Alison McCormick uh, went there. And we had, we had some guidance. We had this aerial photograph, which you should think, what else do you need? But there's no GPS coordinates, it's not geo reference, um, it's not the scale, and it's an oblique photo. So it's not clear where exactly is this pit. And then when you actually go into the woods, here's our Here's our actually um, geophysical line. When you go into the woods, there's no hints. There's no depression. There's no debris at surface. It's a beautiful bucolic forest of people biking and having picnics and largely ignorant of, of what happened during this, during this war period. So we did have a sense of the trend of where we might find the pit. So we laid, we laid again, uh, cabling for this technique of electrical resistivity tomography that images in detail the subsurface in terms of its electrical properties not knowing exactly where the pit is, but thinking we were on, on track. So we started running, we ran 180 kilometers of, of eight meters of line here, we're looking about 12 meters down, there's hot pink, highly resistive bodies, are indicative of these dry glacial fluvial sands that are common in the outwash deposits of, of this part of Lithuania. And then we crossed this 25 meter low conductivity, I'm sorry, low resistivity, higher conductive um, higher conductive tide that fits the dimensions of, of the pit and fits the pattern that we expect moving from sand to a pit that's filled with human ash and, and human remains. And then we then cut up that pit in cross sections to map the full dimensions of 25 meters across and about 4 meters deep. But we also had witnesses at Pona from some from right to almost the end of the operation of the extermination of the extermination camp. Like in Fort Nine, at Pon at Ponat, there, there was also there, they also had were mandated under this action one thousand five to exhume the hundred thousand bodies, burn the remains, crush the bones, bury and scatter the, the ashes. So they also recruited a slave brigade a burning brigade of 80 Jews, 76 men, and, and four women. And in the late fall, in the late fall of 1943, one of those, 
one of those burning brigade members, and the corpse of 20, 20 bodies found it. He found three of those bodies to be his wife and two of his daughters, Isaac Dugan, an electrician. And from, from, that, from that moment, he was galvanized to escape. In his testimony, he had two things in his mind. One, of course, was revenge, and the other was simply to tell his story. And so he began digging. Um, behind the, the, well, here's a diagram of the pit that, um, a drawing of the pit that, that Doogie made. So it's, the pit's, um, it, the pit's about 22 meters across. They had a, a shelter in here. They had a larder in there that they stored the food that they were given, which is essentially rotten potatoes. And behind that ladder, hidden out of sight, he started digging at night. So he burned bodies in the day, and he, and he dig at night with a, a spoon and a cup. He was an electrician, so when the SS had a, a, a light stand that failed, he fixed it, and then he surreptitiously and unbelievably ran a wire into, into the tunnel to assist in, in the digging. And, that, and the light bulb was necessary because he got far enough in that, that there wasn't enough oxygen to, to light his candle. And you can see that the pit was very well guarded. There were two concentric rings of barbed wire fencing, a minefield, not Lithuanian guards, but SS guards with machine guns and dogs. They did not want anyone to escape. They did not want the world or even the German public to know what was happening, what these burning brigades were, were carrying out. So on August, so, so anyway, so Dugin started digging all by himself, and eventually, he, he, gradually, he, and, and nobody even knew. Not, none of the other members of the burning brigade knew about this, but gradually, he recruited other members of the burning brigade. And eventually, they dug a tunnel according to Dugin, 32 meters long, and on August 5th, 15th, I'm sorry, April 15th, 1944, last night of Passover, and not because it's the Jewish holiday, the Festival of Freedom, but because they, they'd, reached, um, they'd reached the length, they'd reached the, the furthest fence, and it was a dark night, they broke out. 12 actually, 12 actually broke out, 11 survived till the, till the end of the war. We don't know exactly what happened to the others, but there was noise, a stick broke, someone stepped on a mine, there was machine gun fire, a dog. Nevertheless, it was miraculous that even 12 escaped and 11 survived, survived to the end of the war. And this became this dramatic piece of, of history that was slowly forgotten, and especially behind the Iron Curtain. And, and again, the Soviet narrative of the Holocaust wasn't about Jews, it was about fascists killing Soviet citizens. Lithuania became independent in 1990. In 1994, Isaac Dugin and one of the other Burning Brigade members, Moki Zaida, they returned to Pona with an archaeologist, with Dugin's drawings, and they excavated, and they found nothing. So this had gone from a piece of history to a myth to a complete fable. Nobody believed him, not even his, his children, and not even their children and, and grandchildren. In 2004, archaeologists actually excavated the, the bottom of the pit and they identified the actual entrance to the tunnel, but they never excavated further. They, they, they filled it back in, and actually the report, we never even saw the report until long after we had, we had done our work. So, Alice and myself, after finding the, um, the burial pit, Soviet pit one, the archaeologists and the museum historians and the Jewish community, they said, you know, this is story about this tunnel, we don't really believe it, but we've heard there's an escape tunnel out of pit six. Maybe you could take a look at it. So we were working with an archaeologist, Dr. Richard Coyne, who recruited a volunteer, Ken Ben Simon, elderly man who was, uh, who was a retired prison architect. And so between the archaeologist and the prison architect, we laid our, our first line in a fairly logical place, and we immediately identified this vertical, narrow, conductive anomaly that mimicked what we expected the tunnel morphology to look like. The tunnel was described as being 30 centimeters wide, 70 centimeters tall. We thought we had it, and then we carried on and we collected two more sections across the tunnel, and then a fourth section across the tunnel entrance. At that point, we were sure we had it, and then to make 100% sure, we collected a section beyond the tunnel entrance. So here we are in pit six, and we collect the tunnel entrance is about here, Friends of the tunnel was right there, and gratefully we saw absolutely nothing there. We also collected a section beyond the tunnel tunnel exit. So we were very confident we found found the tunnel. We felt pretty good 
we felt pretty good about ourselves. We had a, um, I think we had a beer or two that, that night. But the world, the world's best one, Craig, this is front, this is front page news all over the world. It was the New York Times um, science, one of the New York Times science stories of the year it was front page news in Germany, England, and of course Israel. And, and you know, I like to think it was because we were great geophysicists, which, which maybe we are or maybe we aren't, but of course the, the reason this was such a big story is this is such an astounding story of, of resilience. So, so anyone, anyone who's faced challenges and difficult and seemingly in, insurmountable problems could, could certainly relate to this story. And of course, some of the people that, that read this story were the actual children and grandchildren of the, of the, of the, of the burning brigade. So here are eight of them in Israel, in Israel, and um, gathered together for a photograph. And behind them, the, the tall person is is John Seligman. He's a, a head of research at the Israel Antiquities Authority. Um, this woman is a doctor, and she's the daughter of Isaac, Isaac Dugan, and this is his, his granddaughter. And here's Dr. Richard Point. And this Dr. Richard Point in the hat and mustache, he was actually the, um, it was actually his idea that, that the first look for this tunnel. And in fact, he was the engine behind all of the geophysical archaeological programs that, that we, we carried out. Richard died last July from a bone marrow transplant in, in um, bone marrow transplant, from the uh, rejection of a bone marrow transplant, but I carried out archaeological surveys with Richard from 2002 until, until last year. And I know Richard would say, he would look at this picture, and he would say, this is what archaeology was about, this is what geophysics was about. That is, it's not about finding artifacts, it's not about putting things into museums or putting things into warehouses or making maps. It's about people and relating those people to history. So we looked at two important sites, probably fairly obscure sites to most people. We may not have heard of either of them, but in fact, these were ground zero for the Holocaust. This is where the Holocaust began. This is where a million and a half people were, were shot in what became known as the Holocaust by bullets um, in the early parts of the Holocaust. But of course, we all know that the Nazi, the Nazi mechanism then transformed to the more mechanized, calculated um, uh, killing of, of Jews in, in concentration camps and, and further extermination camps that had no purpose other than to kill and, and process people. In January, so again, all the, most of the events we saw here, even though Fort 9 and um, on our operation in 1944. Most of the killing happened in 1941, early 1942. In January 1942, the infamous Wannsee conference happened, where only 15 Nazis, obscure Nazi bureaucrats, got together to come up with a final solution. Who were these bureaucrats? Eight of them were, were PhDs, the others were economists and statisticians. Absolute bureaucrats that, that clearly speak to the banality of evil. And their, their creation was the creation of the Operation Reinhardt Camp, purpose-built killing sites. So those were Treblinka, Belzec, and what we're looking at here, Sobibor. All of them were eastern Pol in eastern Poland, remote part of Poland near the, near the Belarus and, and Ukraine border. And again, as in, as in Fort Nine, when I, first, when I went, first went to Sobibor in 2008, this few college fires with people coming from far away to go biking, mountain biking, having picnics, enjoy the, enjoy the solitude. But this is actually on the site. This is actually on the site of the concentration camp. And also when I went there first in 2008, really the, the actual village of Sobiwa, I don't think it, it looked a whole lot different than it probably looked in 1941 or, or before the war. So besides actually designing the, the camp and the mechanism for killing, at once he comes, they also, they also envisioned and, and eventually put together this infrastructure. Initially, just to take Jews, all the Jews from Poland, and feed them into the, the three Operation Reinhardt camps. But eventually, the operations of the camp expanded to capture Jews from all, from all over Europe. And again, we know, more or less, we, we know what happened there. We have um, trained, and, and we have trained manifests that actually list the number of people, that list their names 
tell us where they came from, that tell us how much the, the tickets cost, that, that how much the German rail system or the Dutch rail system, the French rail system charged to transport these, these people. And we even have Nazi telegrams. This one's from December 31st, 1942, that gives a, a running count of how many Jews were killed. And we know it at, at Majdanek and Lublin, eventually about 150,000 Jews were killed. In Treblinka, eventually 950,000 Jews were killed with 70, about 70 escaping at the end and surviving to the end of the war. At Belgis, 450,000 were killed with two escaping and only one surviving to the end of the war. And so we were, two months, we have not, 247,000 Jews and 3,000 Roma, Soviet, POWs and communists were, were, were killed. And 47 survived to the end of the war. How did they get out? Well, there were a few that got out early in the, during the construction of the camp from work, camp work groups that work hard that are working outside the fence. But on October 14, 1943, there was a, there was a mass breakout at, at the camp. First, um, it was first initiated by um, a, Soviet, a Jewish Soviet POW, Sasha, Sasha Pachetsky, who came into the camp in, um, in September. The Nazis kept Generally, they kept 500 to 600 workers alive, Jewish workers alive, to operate the camp. And each team teamed up with the son of a rabbi, Leon Feldhansel. And together they laid a meticulously well planned escape. On October 14th, at precisely at 4 o'clock, they and, and most of the people weren't aware, only a dozen or so people in the camp, workers in the camp, were aware of the plan. They started to alert Nazi officers, SS officers, and the camp was operated by about 20 SS officers, about 400 Ukrainian guards. They started to alert those SS officers one by one into the barracks, behind the barracks, into the rooms. We have, look, we have some perfect fitting boots for you. We have a fantastic leather jacket, which, which we recovered from the, from the barracks. We have jewelry, and as those SS officers alerted one by one, they axed them, they clubbed them, they knifed them, they recovered their, their weapons. And eventually they killed 13 SS officers and three Ukrainian guards. At that point, the plot was, the, the escape plan was, was found out, machine gun fire broke out, hundreds of um, Jewish prisoners ran for the gate. And not all the Jewish prisoners, about half the workforce, about, about 300. They pushed open the main gate, some climbed, laid, laid ladders and climbed over the, the fence. About 100 were initially blown up in a minefield, machine gun down, another 150 were later hunted down by Polish peasants and, and the SS, but 47 did, did survive to the end of the war. As you can see, they provided testimony and even maps of what the camp looked like. So with this escape, the, the word was out, the secret was out, so the SS destroyed the camp. They, they used the surviving um, workers that were still in the camp that didn't flee brought workers from Treblinka, they blew up the gas chambers, they destroyed the barracks, they plowed the, they plowed the landscape, they planted a forest. So look, here we're looking at, the, here you can actually see the plow marks. This is from excavations in 2016, you can see the plow marks. And, and, and this was underneath the women's barracks in close proximity to the, to the gas chambers. So you can see tendons and hairpins that fell through the, through the floorboards. So they want to leave no trace what was done there. Air corridors were destroyed. Most of the surviving SS were, were killed in the Italian front. So in, 2000, in 2016, I'm sorry, 2007, 2007, Yoram um, Khaimi from the Israel Antiquities Authority and Wojtek Mazurek from a Polish archaeologist got together and they wanted to, for the first time, apply archaeological modern archaeological investigation techniques to a, um, to a extermination camp, essentially in industrial archaeology. And this is part of um, Yoram's PhD thesis. He wanted, to, he wanted this to become his PhD thesis because no one had ever done this. But also, he had lost two uncles at, two un uncles at Sobibor. Sobibor, as you can imagine, Sobibor, Treblinka, and Belzec, they are also iconic targets for Holocaust deniers. You say 1.8 million Jews died there, so where are the crematoriums? Where are the bodies? Where are the gas chambers? Where are the mass graves? There were none to be seen, none at, none at all. So Yoram went in 2007, 
process would be he he had he had um, adjusted his map to about 20 other maps, including from Ukraine, from Ukrainian guys, from SS that survived, from Jewish escapees. But as you can see, every map is different. Why? Of course, people's memories fade, but they also remember different things. And also, except for except for Bauer, who actually ran the gas chambers, no, no Jew ever went near the gas chambers and survived. Now there was also air photos. All the air photos contemporary with the operation of the camp were destroyed, but there were 1944 um, Luftwaffe photos post-destruction of the camp. So you can see what the camp looked like. It was a, a, a completely fenced in. And then there were individual camps within the camp. Whereas as the Jewish survivors described in their testimony, cages within cages. There was a war lager where the, the Jewish victims were taken off the train. Um, there was Camp 1, where the, where the Jewish workforce was housed. Camp 2, where Jewish belongings, taking the victims with the sword. And then Camp 3, where the killing occurred. Camp 4 was used for reconditioning Russian, Russian am ammunition. So your own thought was easy. You had air photos, you had maps. 2007, they, they started digging on what they were, were confident with the gas chambers. They found no trace of the gas chambers. They definitely found artifacts that, that could be related to the operation of a concentration camp, potentially an extermination camp, but no gas chambers, no burials, no crematorium. So you're almost familiar with some of the work I've been do, doing previously in, in Israel over the years. So he invited, my, he invited myself and Dr. Richard to carry out investigations there. And the first thing we did was take GPS coordinates with, that is precisely mapping a number of features that existed at the camp during the time of the camp, also existed today, of course, so we could GPS them in, but also were visible on the air photo. So then we would have precise coordinates that we could change that air photo from an oblique, um, out of scale photo to a photographic base map. So the home of the commandant, Frank Stengel, was still there. Still there. Stengel survived the war, he escaped to Syria, he went to Brazil, he worked for Volkswagen, he was eventually ex ex extradited to Germany where he died in, died in prison. Uh, we GPS the trench surrounding Camp 1, an excrement filled trench that along with barbed wire with fencing and minefields surrounded the Jewish barracks. Uh, the, the rail siding that is the same rail siding today as existed in, in 1941 and 1944, and a number of other features. So with these precise GPS coordinates, we could then take those coordinates from uh, UTMs that, that we had mapped in, apply them to the air photo, and stretch and work the air photo so it becomes more than the air photo, but an actual map. And then we took the air photo and we walked to what we thought were the, the gas chambers. And we started mapping with a whole variety of geophysical techniques, radar, high resolution, metal detecting mapping, magnetics, and what we found was thousands of, thousands of, um, literally thousands of metal anomalies and other, other features. And it wasn't, it certainly was not clear like where, where the gas chambers were. So the first thing we wanted to know were these anomalies, these features we were mapping actually significant. So we randomly picked 12 and we excavated them. And each and every one of them related not only to a concentration camp, but to deaths in close proximity to a chilling area. So for instance, this seemingly innocuous looking um, small spike. This was a spike for narrow gauge rail that could handicap people directly from the from the rail siding to the gas chambers and then took the gas the bodies from the gas chambers to the burial. But the most important data set we we we, we collected was this, and we were just there for five days. This is the most important data set we collected. These these circular anomalies that we interpreted as as post holes, and we thought we found the gas chambers because the gas chambers were the only the only building that was on a, on a foundation. It was raised off the ground so the bodies could be more easily removed. And in fact, they were post holes, one and a half meters deep post holes, but they weren't in the gas chamber. But what they were of were of Camp 3, of the fence surrounding Lager 3, where the killing occurred. So the archaeologists excavated the series of post holes in Camp 3. That led into these two parallel lines of fence posts. And these are what we call the tube, or what the Nazis, what the SS cynically called the Himmelstrasse, or the Heaven Street. And this led directly from the from the war lager, the, the rail siding, the unloading platform, directly to the gas chambers. So 
they simply followed the Himmelstrasse up right to the gas chamber. The archaeologists excavated these in 2000, 2014, and there's eight chambers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And here they are um, interpreted, the eight, the eight gas chambers in the alleyway, and this ninth chamber at the end, this is where a uh, captured Soviet tank engine it wasn't Zyklon B here, it was a Soviet tank engine that produced a chilling agent that was um, carbon, carbon monoxide. And again, we come back to the excavation so you can see what that originally looked like. And of course, as you can imagine, the types of artifacts that were found at the excavation too, the type of, types of belongings that one would hold until the, the last moments of one's life. So, um, so I, this quote here, I, I actually, I actually never paid any attention. There was a lot of Holocaust nihilism, a whole lot of um, Holocaust nihilist blogs that were out there. I never paid any attention to any of it, but I actually did look up some of it in preparation for this talk, and, and I guess in retrospect, I have to say I find it almost amusing. So here's one from um, someone that was proclaimed um, president of the National Association of Forensic Historians, and that was in May 2008, so before we did our work, and and he said. Um, well, but of course, the real question is a question that even a kindergartner would ask. If the official story for Holocaust story is true, then where exactly are these alleged huge mass graves? It's because of Holocaust nihilism like this, I feel compelled to show a few, um, what I think will be disturbing photos in the next, next few slides. So this is 2008, before the com commercial drones were available. I wanted to use aerial imagery from infrared cameras and, and regular light cameras to see some of these open areas, if we could identify some of these mass graves. And there was a general area that had been identified by the Soviets as a mass grave, uh, uh, as, with, as the center of all the mass graves, called the Mon Monument of Ashes. And in a similar fashion, it has been identified at other sites. You could very clearly see in, in both the infrared and even just the regular visual light, these areas of darker vegetation that, that, were indicative, that were suggestive of mass graves. But we also had magnetic radar other types of geophysical information. So this we collected in the summer of 2008. And again, I only just saw this um, a few days ago when I was, I was looking some of these up for the talk, but, but and this was addressed directly at me, um, personally at me. Just imagine every patch of green grass is proof that there are thousands of murdered Jews buried below it. And we also identified from the magnetics in, um, in 2008 was was again a lot of magnetic anomalies, but also in particular this one square here that at the time I interpreted as an outdoor crematorium because we knew from testimonies that that Jewish um, slave labor they would take in whales and they would build these outdoor crema crematoria here. Anyways, in 2016, something unusual that happened with very few Holocaust sites, exhumations were were carried out under the supervision of the head rabbi of Poland, Mike Rabbi Michael. Schubrick, a fantastic person. So you can see, so, we'll see. So you can see here's the um, here's my aerial photograph, and here's where the exhumations were, were carried out. And this is what was found. Everywhere we had identified mass graves were indeed mass graves. The, the types, the way, the, uh, so both um, human skeletons scattered in a very haphazard fashion, as would be typical in, in a violent mass grave burial, as well as um, vast volumes of, of human ash as well as evidence of um, violent deaths. And, and I, I can tell you also that recently there has been DNA analysis on some of these skeletal remains. There's no question they were Ashkenazi Jews from Tobago extermination, um, from the Tobago extermination camp. Um, we also identified the remains of, of one crematorium, and the archaeologists went on to excavate eight other crematoriums, so nine outdoor crematoriums down. So what do we see? We see remains of human ash, we see the remains of machinery that was actually used to crush bone, we see, we see pieces of rail, contorted rail from the heat of course, and we see um, the shadows of, of wooden hoarding, wooden panels that were placed in the ground. Even the SS couldn't bear the sight and the smell of these the horrible atrocities that were occurring at these um, outdoor crematoria areas. So we looked at three sites. And I have one site which I'll speak to very, very quickly. But these three sites are, of course, three sites of, of horrible, horrible atrocities. 
But there were also sites that have another common hollow. They were all sites of resistance. Two of those sites were sites of escape, Fortine and, and Kona. And then one of those sites, Sobi War, was a site of, um, of, a, of a violent revolt. But there were other types of resistance, often lesser known or less glamorous, but just simply unheard of in the Holocaust because nobody, nobody survived. It was spiritual resistance. It was simply the resistance of, of, of having the, the will to live. And probably one, one of the most renowned acts of resistance that, that wasn't related to escape or, or violent resistance was archival resistance, that is storing the documents and the atrocities that, that were occurring in, in real time, in contemporary time, so that even if they went, even if the Jews went went to survive, at least the, their story would survive, their history would survive versus just the Nazi version of history. And of course the most famous episode of this um, archival resistance of this of this document recording documentation is the Ring of Bloom archive. So the Ring of Bloom archives were organized by a professional archivist, Dr. Emmanuel Ringelbloom, who certainly had many opportunities to escape the Warsaw Ghetto and escape and escape Poland. And, and it's very fitting that I I finish on, on the Ring of Bloom archives because of course we're we're now at the 80th anniversary of the of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising that occurred in April of, of 1943. So Ring of Bloom organized a cabal, a group of 60 playwrights, archivists, um, play, um, writers, um, sociologists, politicians, um, statisticians, and called them the Onet Shabbat group. And together they secretly organized and captured tens of thousands of tens of thousands of documents. We don't know how many documents were created, but, but probably an es estimated fifty to seventy thousand documents. And then successively, as the Warsaw Ghetto got closed off, as it was clear that they were all going to be killed, they hid the documents. They hid the first cache in these square steel boxes. They hid the second cache in these two milk cans. And then they hid the third cache and we don't know how many milk cans, but multiple milk milk cans. Um, of those sixty, of those sixty archivists, fifty-seven were killed. Only three survived. Following the war, immediately following the war, the three survivors in the Orange Shabbat group they went looking for these for these archives. So this is what Warsaw and Warsaw Ghetto looked like after the war. The Nazis had reduced it building by building to to brick, so it was it was impossible to even identify streets and street names. Never mind buildings and never mind particular um, locations. But in fact, in September 1946, the first archive was, was found, the steel boxes. In December 1950, the second archive was found, the, the metal milk cans. But the third archive was never found. And movies have been made about it, Spiel, Nancy Spielberg, um, um, Spielberg's daughter Nancy Spielberg made a movie about it, books have been written about it. And they know where it is. There's testimony that says it was buried at 34 spreader disc it was a it was a street address but that's easy it's nevertheless it's so easier said than done and the general wisdom the common wisdom is that well 34 spreader disc at that at problem on top of problem it's underneath the chinese embassy and they're not too keen to give access to a bunch of uh, especially at, at that time a bunch of canadian archaeologists and historians who start digging in their backyard but myself and my colleague Alison O'Connor we Instead of just taking the conventional wisdom, we went back to the old street maps of, of Warsaw. And here's here's Spreda in 1945. Here's the boundary of the Warsaw Ghetto. And you see this triangle that was part of the Warsaw Ghetto. And this is the Brushmakers factory. If you've ever seen the movie The Pianist, this is where the uprising begins. This is where the, the German tanks enter, enter the ghetto. And the reason is because the Brushmakers factory was controlled by the by the Jewish factory workers there at the time in, in the ghetto. But now if you move ahead to 2020, you see that the, the street plan was changed. Now Spreader Jessica takes this bend, and um, this triangle is then incorporated into Kaczynski's Park. So we realized that 34 Spreader Jessica at the time was actually not under the Chinese embassy, but in Kaczynski's Park, which is fantastic because even if it was somewhere else in Warsaw, it would be very difficult to start looking apart a, a building. So we had a, we had a day in Kaczynski's Park, 
and we started collecting geophysical data. So we first we collected a line of 2D resistivity data, and we entered the street, our best guess where 34 shredded disk was. And all these vertical pink pieces we've interpreted as walls and comp, and the horizontal pieces are foundation and walls and foundation, essentially basement stuff, and probably some of them were in the lean. And, and the testimony had said that the, the metal metal cans were hidden inside the wall. And then we collected high resolution metal detecting that data, pin flagging a number of areas, and where we had a cluster of, of metal hits correlating with the wall. We had to give it a, a try, give it a guess somewhere. We hoped that maybe that was the metal melt cans inside the wall, the missing cache of the Ring of Bloom archive. Well, it wasn't. The walls were there, and here's the metal, and here's the metal that was that, that we found. But in fact, it was, there's no question, it was part of the ghetto. Uh, uh, certainly our map reinterpretation was correct. And there's no question that it was that, that, that part of the ghetto had a Hebrew presence. We found, found the remains of a Sidur, other Hebrew script, a Hebrew plaque. And there's no question it was, it was a scene of violence. Um, shells, um, both um, large artillery shells and many bullet casings were, were found. And I want to finish here by pointing out that you know, as great as geophysics is, and there's a heck of a lot more to be found, there's many questions to be answered, not only for archaeologists, not only for historians, not only for museum curators who, who are looking to gather this material and, and create memorialization, but also for the public at large, because I think that's why we continually see more Holocaust literature, more Holocaust movies, because there is so much to be learned from, from this period of history, even for someone so highly esteemed, so knowledgeable as, as a Vladimir Zelensky. And I'd be certainly happy to answer any questions. Thank you, thank you very much for, for sitting through this talk. I know it's not all, it's not, it's not the easiest of material, but I appreciate the attention.